Okay, we'll get started. So welcome to the first breakout session uh, of today, of Saturday, our last day of the conference. And this session is all on GRIC disorder. And so we're gonna hear from a couple of families and then we are um, going to hear from Dr. Jeff Swanson, who's uh, connected to many of the families around the world with, uh, with GRIC disorder. Um, so first uh, we'll hear from Amy Jo. Hi, I'm Amy and this is our daughter, Katie. Katie is 17 and Katie has a GRIC2 mutation, which affects her in many ways. She's pretty dependent on us. We have to get her dressed and help feed her. She's not quite potty trained, but that's getting a lot better. She needs help with toothbrushing and hair brushing and things like that. So a lot of daily tasks she can't do by herself. In this presentation, I'm just gonna talk about her and what she can do. And I'm also gonna talk about what we've done to try to help her with her dis disabilities through the years. Katie was born, it was an easy delivery. I didn't have any complications. She had minor jaundice, but that was it. Otherwise she was pretty healthy. She was a pretty typical baby for the first year of life. She ate well and slept well, and we didn't have really any concerns at all. The first delay we noticed with Katie was when she wasn't able to sit. She didn't have the core strength to sit on her own until 18 months, which is pretty delayed. And standing was delayed. Crawling, she never did crawl. She would scoot around. But I wish I would have known then how important crawling is to development. But she went right, right into walking, and that wasn't until age five. So, of course, very delayed. She started taking some steps, and she's just gotten better and better with that. But she's still a little unbalanced. Babbling, she didn't babble much as a baby. She does a little bit now. She will babble as if she's trying to tell us something. Talking, she can say a couple words. She says mama pretty uh, consistently and appropriately. And she will once in a while say yeah appropriately, but it's maybe uh, twice a month. So it's not very often. Fine motor skills we're always working on. She uh, needs a lot of help with feeding and that type of thing. Um, she can't write, she can scribble. So she's got you know, a lot of delays in all of these areas. Katie probably understands more than I give her credit for. I can ask her to get me that book and give it to me and she can do that. She can identify numbers and letters and things like that. She can make choices such as which shirt do you want to wear and she will point to which one she wants to wear. And she can nod her head for yes, but for no, she cannot do the nod for no. She just kind of pushes her arms out to let us know she doesn't want something. We've done all the traditional therapies with Katie throughout the years, probably since she was about two, and they've been great. And she's made a lot of progress, but I'm gonna to talk to you mainly about the non-traditional things we've tried that have helped, seem to help her. One of the first things we did was the horse therapy. And first of all, Katie loved being on a horse. So it was really fun for her to do this. And horse therapy helps you gain core strength because you're using muscles you don't normally use. And she did this from age two to probably age six. And it was a really fun thing to take her to because she enjoyed it. We also did a summer program called Conductive Education. And this is something, it's like a therapy, but they call it education. It's based out of Hungary and it's task oriented for kids with motor disorders. So they work out with these ladders on leg strength and things like that. And they also sing throughout the entire three hours a day that you're there. Um, 
the conductor is what she calls herself, will sing. I think that helps to calm the kids down. And um, it was a really good therapy that we did for probably three summers. I also had Katie do this Therasuit therapy and it was great. This is a suit that the therapist puts her in. This we did locally here in Phoenix and found one guy in the whole Phoenix metropolitan area that does this. Maybe there's more now, but he would put this outfit on her and tighten these straps according to what she needed and it gets her in the correct position to get her in the correct body position to do different tasks. She did therapy things like reaching down and getting a ball and walking over something and all kinds of different things. It was three hours a day for three weeks and what it does is creates muscle memory. So when you do something that long over a period of time, then your muscles are supposed to remember to be in that position. And I feel like this really did help her a lot. I might even do another uh, three week session sometime in the future. But this um, child on the right, it is just a picture of them doing this same therapy, but they use these pulleys for different, different things. But it was something that I really think helped her a lot and um, it helped her with being able to walk around better and not so wobbly. So this FIO is a stabilizing pressure input orthosis and it just is a compression garment that helps your child to know where their body is in space, which she had an issue with and still probably does. Um, I think this is a great thing, but it was really hard to use this in Arizona since it gets so hot here. It was hard to put this on her and put clothes on her and then it's 115 degrees out. So we did use it in the winter and I think this is a really good thing if your child has issues with knowing where their body is in space. This next thing called a swash, sitting, walking, and standing hip orthosis, is something that she would use in preschool. She was in a preschool for kids with special needs at age three and she would crisscross her legs when she was walking. She'd scissor her legs. So what this does is help keep her hips and legs in the correct position. She needed to have this on for three hours a day. It was perfect because they kept it at school. They would put it on her at school and take it off of her and send her home. And she wore this for maybe a year and it really helped her a lot. And I didn't have to do much with this, so that was really nice. But uh, these things were really helpful for Katie with her walking and keeping her legs in the same position or in the position they should have been in. Katie also used the typical leg braces, which she had at an early age. Uh, she needed these because her feet would turn inwards and they still do, so she still has them and uh, also a walker just because she couldn't bear weight and so we used that for several years. She even had it in school probably through first grade. So now I'm just going to talk about some things that are a little quirky and unusual with Katie and you might be able to relate to some of this. Um, when she was really little she'd stand like this on the left and um, I think the leg braces really helped, but she would clench her toes and her hands a lot. And I think that's a stability issue, seems like. And um, she would stand on the top of her foot a lot, which was very strange, but it doesn't happen anymore. And I think it's because of the leg braces that she would use. Okay, so we've had this tongue issue for a long time, probably twice a year for three weeks at a time, her tongue will just stick out. I think it's probably allergy related, but I've tried all kinds of things and um, it just happens. No doctors seem to know what it is, but I think it's a seasonal allergy when her tongue sticks out. It also, she'll stick her tongue out like this. If she gets real tired, her tongue just starts hanging out. So 
Um, and then these, this picture on the right, oh my gosh, she will not brush her bangs or her hair out of her face. So she is usually in a ponytail, even when she sleeps. If her hair is in her face, she just lets it hang there and doesn't even brush it out of her face ever. Katie walks with her left arm behind her back. We're trying to stop it, but I don't know why she does it, but she does. And then in this other picture, her right arm is constantly up like this most of the time. And uh, they say it makes her feel more stable to have her arm like that. Katie has never scratched an itch. It's so strange. I've never seen her scratch an itch. She can also, in this other picture, if she sits on toys, it doesn't seem to bother her. Um, one time I took her diaper off and there was a toy in it. <laughs> and um, it was just kind of an odd thing that I thought I'd include. She also has some typical sensory issues that we deal with. I have to brush her teeth and I have to pin her down. Um, I have to sing a song to make her not get mad. <laughs> and that's just typical. Uh, hair brushing isn't as bad, but she doesn't really like that either. Certain textures she doesn't like, such as if she has to put her ha hand in a thing of slime or shaving cream or something like that, that takes a while. Loud noises also, and then she does not like her feet touched for some reason. I'm going to end with this slide. Katie is a happy girl. She loves to have fun and be silly. Of course, she has her moments like we all do, but in general, she's a pretty happy person. She is on a gluten-free diet, and I do feel like that has helped with her mood over the years, and we are happy to be her parents, and I thank you for watching this presentation. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Danielle Butler, um, who also has a daughter with a, with a recent GRIC2 diagnosis. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Um, I'm Danielle, this is my husband, Bobby. We are a blended family of seven for, um, who have, some sort of disability or diagnosis. Um, so it's myself, Bobby, have an 22-year-old uh, with autism. His name is Brandon, a 21-year-old neurotypical daughter, Sierra. Um, Oliver is four and a half and he has prader willi syndrome. And then we have Charlotte who's recently diagnosed with GRIC2. Um, we, two years ago, um, moved in our brother-in-law, John, and he has Down syndrome. So, and he's 46 years old. So that's our household. This is Charlotte. Um, generally, she's always happy, smiling. Um, she usually takes all the attention in the room that she's in, uh, never stops moving. Um, sorry. Since uh, we just got the diagnosis, I don't have too many therapies to share with you. So I thought I would talk about what led to uh, us getting her tested and some of the symptoms we've noticed. Um, to begin with, uh, we had Oliver and nothing could prepare us for that diagnosis in the NICU, a normal pregnancy with both Oliver and Charlotte. But we did notice hypotonia. We did notice... Um, some feeding issues. So those type of things got our antennas peaked when we had Charlotte a couple of years later. Um, before we had Charlotte, we did do genetic testing because of having Oliver and because of having our oldest with autism. Um, our testing came back normal, good to go, try to have another baby. Um, and as soon as Charlotte was born, um, I noticed some feeding difficulties. So during the pandemic, she was born in 2020, April, um, April 16th, 2020. So we didn't have any visitors. Not a lot of nurses came in and out only when absolutely necessary. 
um, when I started noticing her just excessively crying and not wanting to latch, uh, very stiff and rigid, uh, I called for the lactation consultant and she kind of stood by the door and said, have you done this before? Is this your first baby? I said, no, it's my fourth baby and I've done this before. She said, you'll get it. Just keep trying and walked out. So we ended up leaving the hospital with not much help um, because I had all of her and I was familiar with a uh, lip and tongue tie at six weeks old. I checked her mouth and discovered a similarity. So we took her to the dentist and had uh, her tongue clipped and thought that was going to solve all the feeding issues. It did not. So we tried bottles. Um, we noticed that when she ate, she ate really fast, vigorously, took in a lot of air, coughed a lot. Um, we tried pacing her. Um, we also noticed uh, sleep problems that we thought were, you know, along with the feeding that she wasn't eating enough or that she was eating too much or that she was gassy. The whole first six months of her life was a blur because of the crying, not sleeping, not eating well. And then we also noticed that she always had to be in some sort of movement to be calm. We, I ended up putting her on the front porch in the sunlight with just a diaper on to take a nap. And that's like how I got rest because that was the only way that she would be comforted. Um, holding her, she wouldn't really rest on my shoulder. She just kind of was stiff. Breastfeeding her, she was constantly pushing away from me. So I thought she didn't want to eat. So I would unlatch, but she was hungry. So looking back now and listening to other families, I realized that that was probably sensory, her pushing against me. And so I was at the doctor getting shots for my shoulders, for my elbow, everything hurt. Um, to this day, she still does that when she's near me, she pushes on me with her hands and her feet. She's never just still sitting next to me. When we're watching a movie, she's moving, pushing, squeezing, biting even. Um, we thought that she was going to have some feeding problems similar to her brother with prader willi syndrome because she's seem to always be hungry, even when she's eating a sufficient amount of food. Um, but the other day, uh, I was going to talk about her overeating, but the other day when I saw another uh, grandchild here chewing, something said, I wonder if this is just an oral, that she needs sensory input orally. So we went to the mall while we were here and I bought her um, a little baby chew toy and she has not overeaten since being here. So I think that might've been what's going on with her. Um, also noticed that when, since being here, she um, spins around a lot. When she's excited, she just, and doesn't seem to get dizzy. She'll stop spinning and go to whatever she's doing and not, not be dizzy. Jumping, running on her toes, we've noticed. Um, she laughs so much. She's a joy to be around. She just never stops moving. So uh, we notice all of these things. And then last summer, when one of my other son, when Oliver's therapist suggested that he might have autism, I thought, okay, so what are the odds that I have an older child with autism? Now, maybe Oliver with autism, let's get Charlotte and myself and my husband tested. So reluctantly, our doctor uh, finally agreed to test everybody. She thought I just had some PTSD from other people in my family who are diagnosed. And she called us a few weeks later, apologizing and saying she does have GRIC2. Um, I don't know what it is. So I'm going to refer you to genetics. And that took nine or 10 months. So during that time, we just spent Googling, 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 joining Facebook groups, trying to find out what is this and how is it affecting my daughter? And so that's how I came across your name, uh, Dr. Swanson, and tried to reach out to you and and then forward my messages to my husband because I did not understand even your ex I was like, what does this mean? I don't know what that question means, but here's her lab work. So um, we got some more explanation on that. And I um, we did have our next appointment to which Charlotte didn't do any of the things I was telling her during that appointment. She sat there quietly on the table with the tablet and said, 
hi and said hello and thank you and bye bye and did all of the things so she's you know the geneticist basically said I don't think that this Greek 2 is even affecting her so we left there even more what do we do you know at this point so um we came here we were invited here to speak and to meet other families and to meet you and hopes to figure out what our next step should be and also hoping to um, help other families that might be like Charlotte um, find some answers some treatments to I mean I don't want to change Charlotte she's wonderful um, but if we could help her get what she needs to sleep better to rest better um, when everyone in the house can rest better. Um, she also has some sleep disturbances that we haven't fi quite figured out what they're coming from. So, although since being here, like last night, she slept great. We don't know if that's because she was in the room with us or oh, we don't know. Sometimes she sleeps good. Sometimes, most of the time she doesn't sleep well. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening. You can just say there and just questions. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I think Amy Murphy is on the line available to answer questions, and um, Danielle is in the room available to answer questions. So, uh, any questions here? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll get this. Okay. Um, I was just uh, wondering, um, has her brother been tested as well? I mean, is was it a genetic link with the older brother? Maybe you said I, I the uh, older brother. Yeah, yeah, with 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 autism diagnosis. Uh, my twenty two year old has not been tested, but since um, being here, uh, what's the name of the people that drew our blood this morning? Oh, the yes, they will draw his blood in October. Okay, so they are going to. Do all of us so yeah he's never been tested for a genetic link so but i've always been curious because my dad um doesn't he he kind of displays he's very similar to my oldest and his dad also doesn't talk hardly at all uh not social so i always thought i thought for sure when we had when we got swapped that something would come back but of the of what they tested nothing no genetic link Okay, thank you. Does uh, your daughter or the other daughter that we heard from, does uh, anybody have epilepsy? Not the um, This is Amy, and <laughs> mine does not. Uh, <clears throat> she does not have any seizures at all. Um, for uh, you, Amy, I have a question. Does your daughter, is she a leg crosser? When she sits, she's always got her leg crossed. She does. Yes, she does. And I don't know why sometimes I'll say, Katie, uncross your legs. Because if she's sitting in the back seat and I go to try to get her out of the car, she'll have her legs crossed. And so if I tell her, you know, uncross your legs, she will. But yes, and I don't know why, but she does usually have them crossed. And how about your daughter? Is she a leg crosser? No, but she um, had a tendency to W sit. Okay. And I mean, because of the other, because I have a little bit of a background, I know to tell her, no, sit right, Charlotte, and she'll fix her legs, but she wants okay. to W sit, even though she seems hypertonic to me, as opposed to hypotonic. And it sounds like Amy's daughter has uh, a reduced sensitivity to pain. Is it the same true for your daughter? Mm -hmm. Or don't know yet? No. Any, does she flinch at all with a blood draw? She didn't flinch, but she cried after. Okay, pretty after. normal then. Mm -hmm. She does, I forgot to say, she does do this. Okay. When we walk through uh, the front doors and the air blows at you, she does that. She does it in the restrooms. She knows it's coming when you're going to put your hands under the blow dryer. Mm. She does cover Katie, it. Katie and does Amy. that too. Katie okay. does the hands over the ears if like she eats a piece of food that's too hot things or if she it's a loud noise or something she will put her hands over her ears too and she didn't cross her legs when she was little i mean that was just probably in the past several years she's crossing yeah. her legs and amy does your daughter um does she flinch at all with blood draws or any other signs that she's got reduced sensitivity to 
to painful things? Well, I would say when she was smaller, it wasn't a problem to get her blood drawn. And now it's a fight. It's really hard to go to doctor's offices when they want to look at her, you know, look in her mouth or whatever. Uh, it's not easy. And like, I couldn't even give her the flu shot this year because she was, she's, even though she's really slender and she looks petite and fragile, she's not fragile, but um, she is strong and she was just fighting. So she does not like to get any of that done now. It's really hard to do. Um, I think that's gotten more like she feels it more now, whereas years ago, maybe she didn't feel like hot and cold wasn't as much of a issue, whereas now she can feel that more so, like if it's the tub water is a little too hot or something. Thank you. Sure. Uh, this is Christina and my son, Arthur is also diagnosed with uh, Greek 2 and what I what I hear resonates very well with him so he would also if if we try to go to the doctor to the uh, uh, pediatrist then he would and he needs he has a cold or something and they want to check his mouth and his ears they would uh, he would kick at the doctor and really fight to get examined for example and if I heard that properly when he was born, he also had a band between uh, his um, tongue. Was it? I think I heard it on Charlotte. So when he was born, he had a band with his between his um, mouth and his tongue. So that needed to be uh, 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 cut uh, because he also had feeding issues. I was breastfeeding him, and I thought that would resolve all the problems, but it didn't. So he was the same as the mother said before. So Arthur was really, he was kind of, it felt like the uh, the milk from the breast was flowing too fast and he couldn't swallow. On the other hand, he was drinking very fast. And uh, so there was a lot, the same thing. He was, he had a lot of air in his stomach. He was like screaming for hours between five in the evening and nine or so. He wouldn't want to fall asleep, constantly crying. Um, yeah, so that really very much resonated with what I heard just from 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 the other mother. So we had the same thing with him. Um, this is Amy, and I just want to say that Katie had a tongue tie and a lip tie, but they were uh -huh. more on the minor side. But I saw something on TV about it, and this was probably about three years ago, and we took her in and had both of those clipped, and I thought it might help make a difference in something it really didn't but um it was it's something nowadays i think they look for where they didn't back when she was born christina this is um uh, jeff swanson i oh, think hi. um hi you, so your child i believe has the same variant as um katie murphy is, yes is that right yeah i just wanted yes. to confirm that is the case yes okay, that just, is and and how does um, he walk? How does Arthur get along? Uh, so he started to walk when he was uh, two and a half, even. But since then, he um, he is like a stable walker. So he can walk. He can even uh, run. Um, he has problems to walk the stairs, so he needs um, always uh, support. But I think. It's also because he's a little scared. So uh, up is easier than down. Um, yeah. And he could, he can even uh, ride uh, the bike with the um, supporting wheels. So, but he would not be able to do that without those. I wanna, is, is he a leg crosser? No, he's not. I was, okay. he's not, no. Need, but he's only, to... he's a five and a half. So maybe that comes later when I listen to Amy. We're going to move on to Dr. Swanson's talk now, but but first mm -hmm. I just want to ask um, Dr. Banky because it, when he was asking about the leg crossing, it felt like everybody turned and looked at him like he was Dr. House about to 
crack the case. And so I just want to ask what the significance is. Hi, my name is Tim Benke. I'm a pediatric neurologist and I'm at the University of Colorado. So uh, leg crossing, it, it looks innocuous because everybody crosses their legs, but there's, I'm seeing it in a number of different neurogenetic disorders. And it's, it's more than just leg crossing because they just do it and you uncross them and then it goes straight back. And it's, it's a like, it's a type of movement disorder that I think is maybe underappreciated. I'm not sure what it means yet, but I think it's a common thread. And it's just another thing that I, I think is a symptom that may help us pull some things together. So that's why I asked. And so thanks for, yeah. for ask, yeah. uh, addressing that. Um, Asha would hold his arm like Amy. Yeah, so then one arm uh, always up and the hand then, so one arm is always up and the hand like uh, is uh, falls down. So like on the picture that um, uh, Katie, so what Amy showed the, the picture of Katie. So this is also how, and he would also run like this. So he's not running like we would, yeah, when we are uh, like jogging so that we would move our arms, but he would like, he wouldn't move his arms when he runs, but he would, the arms are like uh, Katie's arms. Yeah, Thank her arm, arm has, yeah, her arm has been like that for a long time. She'll just keep it up like that. I want to thank Danielle and Amy and Christina for sharing your stories. This was really terrific. Thank you. Thank you. And now to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Swanson from uh, Northwestern. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, so thanks for being here and for sharing your stories with us, Amy and Christina and Danielle. Um, so I'm going to talk about GRICS. I'm, the, the objective is just to give you a view of, or what I know of the GRIC patient population, and then tell you a little bit about um, our recent mouse work with one of the, that, that um, is analogous to the variant that um, Archer and Katie have. So I will, oh, I'm in charge here in principle. All right, so I am, this is an intermediate session. I wanted to make it a little bit approachable to the um, parents in the audience. So the, the genes we're talking about are the GRIA, GRID, GRIC, and GRIN genes, and those make proteins that you'll also um, hear almost interchangeably, perhaps the GLU-K proteins in the case of canate receptors. And you need four of these proteins to make up a functional receptor, which, um, I'll tell you in a sec, complicates some of the interpretation of, of what a variant might do to um, the receptors. And so those proteins assemble in, uh, I think I'm pointing it the wrong way. So it should be that way or that way. We're not, that's right. Nope. Oh, there we are. Okay, so as I said, they have to assemble into four protein complex, and so that is what a canate receptor looks like if you look at the structure uh, with high resolution. And the important thing to to remember for a couple of my slides is that the um, helical um, parts of the protein, which are in the gray, which represents the plasma membrane, those open up, and you have sodium ions primarily that will flow through that. And that makes a current that we can record and use to analyze various aspects of how the receptors work and also characterize the effect of mutations on those receptors. Okay, so just very briefly, what canate receptors do in the brain is distinct from the other types of receptors that you might've heard about including GRIN uh, and GRIA. So these receptors play a subtle role in balancing the excitatory and inhibitory tone in the brain and across circuits. They will have, they'll fine tune neural excitability. And in some cases, they help to stabilize the connections between two different neurons. And the part we perhaps know least about is how they um, assist in development of 
brain and uh, of the neurons. And so to start out, these are the, the GRIC2 variants in, in patients and kids that we know about. The purple bar are the ones that were in a recent report that we had um, a year and a half ago. And I wanna draw your attention to uh, the A657T um, kids. So oh, I think that's easy to do. Okay, so the A67, that's an alanine to a threonine change. There are eight individuals with that um, variant in that we know of in the population. And each of the kids, as you um, heard from two today, for two parents today, have um, intellectual disability, they have speech and motor um, delay and dysfunction to greatly varying degrees. So um, you heard about Otter, who was um, perhaps on the more milder side, and one might say is has balance issues. And you heard about Katie, who is perhaps on the more severe side, where she requires, uh, initially required some assistance walking and still has some, um, you know, difficulties in um, uh, some of the postures and gait. I want to draw a distinction to the kids with a threonine 660 lysine uh, variant because those kids are very severely affected. So these are parts of the protein that are very close to each other. They're only three amino acids away from each other, but the, the outcome for the kids are very different. So those kids have uh, global developmental delay, uh, presumably intellectual disability, but they are uh, severely epileptic, that's poorly managed and they're not ambulatory and they're unable to communicate. So it's hard to um, make further assessments. And at least in one case, uh, there appears to be initial signs of neurodegeneration um, based on uh, three sets of MRIs that have been taken over um, their early life. Uh, there is a second set of patients with variants at the same site where you have a very similar sort of change uh, to an arginine, which is very similar to a lysine. Those kids have similar suite of symptoms, but not as severe. So they have, um, uh, they don't have epilepsy, but they have uh, changes in the way their brain fires that are indicative of a pre-epilepsy state. And they have other sorts of abnormalities in their MRIs as well. Um, so the, the other person I think is, um, important to point out is leucine 619 uh, serine, which then has a frame shift, which essentially this means it's a loss of function um, variant, and that's uh, Charlotte. So she's uh, what we would characterize as a loss of function in what has happened to her canine receptor um, gene. And there are three um, kids that we know about with a similar um, loss of function, truncation. One is uh, uh, glutamine 302 truncation. That um, child was diagnosed with global developmental delay in autism. Uh, Charlotte, who you just heard about. And then we would characterize the um, third uh, child that we um, uh, looked at in our study, the isoleucine 668 threonine as a loss of function or near loss of function because these receptors are not expressed um, to a very great degree on this surface membrane. Okay. Um, so just to compare the, the um, GRIC2 alanine threonine variants um, that you heard about, there's a range of ages up to an adult living um, in assisted living in the Netherlands, uh, five females or three females, five males. They all start with hypotonia initially or motor developmental delay diagnosed between one and five years. And they share a lot of features, um, including in particular the delayed motor development and that plateaus over a pretty wide range of abilities. Um, and the question you asked him whether uh, any whether kids have epilepsy they do not none of the eight kids have epilepsy um, and for those um, children that have had MRIs they've not noticed any kind of um, uh, differences than than uh, normal MRIs and 
oops, the, the point I think that was made earlier that um, all the kids or six out of the eight kids were reported by their parents to be very happy and content in familiar environments. Um, and so let me contrast that, that further with the three eating lysine kids. Um, they have three males, two females. They have seizures and spastic movements, um, motor developmental delays, and that's diagnosed very, very early. Um, profound developmental delays, not ambulatory or li very limited degree of walking. They're not verbal at all. And um, three of the five have epilepsies and um, other symptoms. So I think there's really a big difference in these, these kids, even though the um, changes to their, their glutamate receptor structure is, are very similar in effect. Okay, so um, the point being there. So um, one thing I want to, since we're a little bit pressed for time, I'm going to just blaze through this. So I apologize for this slide. It's a little bit hard to um, appreciate, but there are, there's a main point I want to make. And so this is a way we characterize the function of the receptors. And if you see the, the traces going downward, that's indicative of sodium ions flowing into the receptor, flowing through the receptor across the plasma membrane. And the one thing I want to point out here is that we characterize these proteins as gain of function and loss of function based on analyses like this. And so the green box here is the alanine threonine variant, and we would characterize that as a gain of function because you have more ions going through the, the uh, receptor protein over a, a given amount of time. And you can hopefully appreciate that by the slowed current decay. Or you could have more receptors. They just get to the membrane and are um, have a higher degree of functionality. We also have receptors that are loss of function. And the receptor that I mentioned before, the isoleucine to threonine variant, this expresses very little current on the surface. And what is there is very fast. The receptor closes very quickly and prevents very much uh, of the ions going through it. And then lastly, there are these. Um, types of receptors that are, are hard to characterize because they have elements of both gain of function and loss of function. And what I mean is that the gain of function side, it's very slow to decay like the 657 mutation, but very little of this protein gets to the surface either. So about tenfold less than the wild type GLUK2 receptor. So th those are hard to uh, categorized simply as one uh, one type of effect or the other. And then uh, the point I made earlier was that these two uh, variants, so 657 and 660, if you were just to look at these traces, you would say, well, they look pretty much the same. So the expectation is possibly that the kids might have the same suite of uh, symptoms and phenotypes but that's not the case at all. Even though these look very similar in our reduced system, in fact, the, the kids are very different in how they're affected. So these are useful approximations to predict what might be happening in the brain, but um, they're, they're really just first approximations. So what we know about the GRIC2 disorders is that they, they can be causative for neurodevelopmental disorders. That was something that was um, first reported in 2017, so relatively recently, and that was Katie in that study. Um, variants that cause canate receptors that, that look fairly similar, uh, changes in canate receptors that look fairly similar can cause very different phenotypes in children. Um, one of the variants that we've identified uh, causes white matter abnormality and uh, potentially myelination defects. And um, for at least the, the um, eight kids or one adult and eight, seven kids that have the 657 mutation, they all share fairly similar um, symptoms and features of their disorder. And the three kids with the lysine uh, variant also share similarities. So we think this provides at least initial evidence that those specific changes to their genes really are causative um, and um, penet penetrant for the, um, the disorders. Okay. 
Uh, so we also have a um, suite of kids who have changes in another candidate receptor gene called GRIC5. And these um, kids are all single, isolated cases. They, they aren't multiple individuals that we know of um, yet. They also are distinct from the GRIC2 variants in that it's pretty difficult to find functional changes in the receptor properties so far. There is one example, the 638 variant, where there are clear functional differences in the way the receptor operates. But for the most part, uh, accepting the loss of function um, variant at the bottom, in our analysis, we don't see any differences. That doesn't mean that they're not working differently in the brain, but just at our level, we can't detect any changes. Um, that said, the kids all that we know, uh, the, that we have the clinical information for, all uh, present with or diagnosed with autism. So they share that diagnosis, even though their variants are in different places and um, don't appear to cause functional changes in our electrophysiological analysis. So we're still waiting on clinical information for two or three of the um, uh, kids in this study. So there are, so GRIC2 is not the only kinate receptor that can be causative for neurodevelopmental disorders. Okay, so um, to just move through this quickly, since I think we've seen this before is, so we anal tend to analyze receptors that look like this. So they're either all wild type or they're all um, mutant uh, receptors that are models for the GRIC2 variants that are seen in patients. But it's a lot more complicated in the brain. So these are um, single allele de novo variants. So they still have, they're still a wild type GLUK2 making protein presumably in the brain of the kids. And so uh, we have to make this slightly more complicated where it has two uh, GLUK2 and two GLUK2 mutant um, proteins. And then it becomes even more complicated because there are other proteins that can combine into these receptors, uh, including GLUK5. And then that even becomes a little more complicated because there are other proteins that can interact with these receptors and increase the diversity of the types of receptors you might see in the brain. So we're primarily analyzing receptors on the left side. The brain receptors look more like the right side. And so to um, bridge the gap there, as you've heard already many times, we, we need model systems and to overcome some of the challenges that the receptors change during development or they're different in different brain regions or neurons or even different parts of individual neurons. We have to use models in order to say, to inform us about what might be going on in Katie. This is a, a picture now that's many years old. And, um, and so we use mice. You've heard that to this, um, this meeting very often. There are other model systems. We heard a very nice talk this morning about a variety of model systems that have been considered in Fragile X syndrome, but um, at the moment, the mice remain the, the primary uh, model of choice. And so we made the mice that uh, model the 657 mutant. These are uh, created with uh, gene editing techniques. The um, Males, male um, mutant mice are, are viable and can be used for breeding, females are not. And these are only, um, they only live as heterozygous mice. So they have one copy of the mutant allele, one copy of the regular GLUK2 uh, or GRIC2 gene. They look grossly normal as they grow up and um, they have a variety of physiological phenotypes. The first thing that we really wanted to do was make sure that the, the mutant GLUK2 protein was made and incorporated into normal brain kinate receptors. And it turns out we have a very easy way of doing that. If we analyze uh, some of the signaling at a synapse in the hippocampus, we can sim simply look to see whether that slow decay that we saw in our reduced system is present in these neuronal kinate receptors. And that would give us a good indication that the mutant GLUK2 subunit had been incorporated into those receptors, which is an important thing to know if we then want to go on and try to interpret 
how the altered candidate receptor function gives rise to behaviors. And so I won't go into the details, but um, this was a reassuring set of uh, piece of data. And then coming back to the, the sorts of things one wants to study, once you have a mouse, there are many, many different types of behavioral um, tests and tasks you can ask mice to do. But we focused on the motor development initially because that was such a consistent observation in uh, most of the kids or many of the kids. And so the first thing we wanted to do is just look to see whether there was some phenotype um, in these mice that seemed as though that it uh, was uh, related to motor function. And so one of the things you can do is you can hang mice by their tail and then look to see how they hold their feet. So this would be testing their posture and um, just the, the um, way that they position their, their uh, legs in this case, hind paws. And so we found in this that the hind, so they tended to hold their hind paws in closer, which is what the hind paw spread measure is about. They tended not to ever stay still. So they were moving the entire time that we um, suspended the mice. And they did a lot of clasping, which simply means that they're grabbing their hands together. In this case, not their hands, but their hind paws. So these are all indicative of postural dysfunction in the mice. Uh, we can also ask them to do balancing type tests. In this case, it's called a ledge test where they just walk along the edge of their cage and the um, 657 mice were not as good at that task. And then finally, we can look at a um, measure called kyphosis, which essentially is how hunched they are in their normal gait. And uh, you, if you look at the picture, the bottom picture are the heterozygous 657 mice, and they just assume a more hunched posture. And this, at least in mice, is associated with an ataxic phenotype. And so all that adds up to a um, composite ataxia score that was described about 13 years ago, now indicating that these mice can be characterized as having an ataxic or at least postural and movement disorder. Um, the other thing that we noticed is that they just don't move very much. So if you put them in a box, wild types on the left, the 657 mice are on the right, and I think you could sort of notice right away what, what isn't happening for the het mice. They simply don't move initially. Um, this is, of course, a sort of extreme example. This mouse is alive. It is sitting there uh, thinking about what it wants to do. And if you look at the, the differences there, um, if they look at the, the calculate the distance over five minutes, how far they, they move, the uh, heterozygous mice are reduced. And that's really um, acutely noticeable in the very first minute where many of them just sit or move very slowly around the, the open field. And uh, so the other um, interesting um, behavior that these mice show is they don't uh, carry out sort of naturalistic behaviors. So naturalistic behaviors would be things that mice normally do. They dig, they groom themselves, they build little nests out of the bedding you provide. So these mice just simply don't dig into their bedding. Um, they don't dig when there are objects placed in their home cage, and they don't dig if you just put them into a cage with bedding. They, um, um, for whatever reason, prefer not to do that. They also do not build nests very well for themselves and they have reduced grooming as well. So these are all um, behaviors that we typically think of as arising from the part of the brain called the striatum. So this, at least to, to a first um, degree, provides some uh, model validation. We have mice that show behavioral changes um, it provides a little bit of uh, evidence that the uh, variance in the um, patients and kids really is causative or, or you know, likely is causative for the disorders that they have. And it also provides us with a set of um, behavioral measures that we can then use to 
see if we can correct with gene editing or with pharmacology. Um, the last thing I wanted to do, and this is really for, for people who know more about the candidate receptors, is candidate receptors is, is getting to a, Tim, a question that Tim asked. A gain of function candidate receptors, if you were just to predict what would happen, you'd predict that would cause convulsions or seizures in mice um, because activating those receptors is a very common way of precipitating um, seizures in mice. But these mice don't have seizures. And in fact, if you use a reduced um, system like this, with, which is just a slice of hippocampus, it turns out that it's difficult to induce these uh, slices to have seizures of, of the sort you might see at the top there. Those sort of bursts of activity are seizures in a dish, essentially. We don't see those in the um, slices from the, the mutant mice. And you can um, characterize this in various ways. If we put on a chemoconvulsant, which is a 4-AP molecule, you can see that we get seizures of this sort in nearly all the wild type mice, but in none of the heterozygous mutant mice. And they're to differing degrees uh, are present in different models. And even at the level of the excitability of individual neurons, we see differences between the wild type mice and the um, 657 mutant mice. So we looking at a particular type of neuron in the hippocampus called the CA3 pyramidal neuron, and just looking at how often it fires an action potential. And you can see the mutant mice fire action potentials much more frequently, and they actually have a slightly shifted membrane potential as well. So the important point that this um, underscores is that there are changes in neuronal signaling that probably are not due to altered canate receptor function, but are due to things that have changed, maybe compensatory change that occurs during early embryonic development or as these parts of the brain um, develop. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, we these mice show a variety of differences from uh, GLUK2 wild type mice at the intrinsic level, at the synaptic level, the circuit level, and the hippocampus at least, and uh, in their behaviors. Um, so it uh, is important to, to realize basically what I just said is that there are alterations that were not predicted based on what we knew from 20 years of canate receptor study. And um, separating out the contributions of disrupted canate receptor signaling versus developmental changes, compensatory changes, will be important to think about how to address the um, different behaviors and probably ultimately um, the dysfunction or disorders in children. And um, this is a point that I thought was um, interesting, but was uh, exactly the opposite point that was made this morning in the Fraxa uh, talk. And that is, if you have changes that are responsible for aspects of behavior that are not um, driven by canate receptor signaling, that might actually offer an opportunity to approach those um, changes at the neuronal or network level that don't require the development of, of drugs that specifically target canate receptors, which is, um, is uh, potentially a positive because there are no drugs that target canate receptors effectively. So that's been the subject of drug development over 20 plus years and has been mostly unsuccessful. So perhaps there are ways to normalize the some level of um, function that don't require those drugs, which have proven so difficult to find. Um, but the uh, so the point I should I should recognize is that this was um, viewed by the the Fraxa um, speaker as a negative. He thought one shouldn't address these compensatory or pleiotropic changes, and it was more important to address the receptor-driven um, signaling. So a little bit of a different um, perspective. 
Okay, so I just wanted to finish by thanking um, the folks in my lab, particularly Brenna Webb, who's a talented grad student. The work in the hippocampus was a collaboration with my colleague Anise Contractor at Northwestern, and much of the results were um, generated by Toshihiro. Uh, Grick families, of course, I'm very thankful for you guys sharing your stories and reaching out to me um, and making this, this type of work possible. And then we're collaborating with Hui Go uh, on the GRIC-5 um, cohort of uh, families and patients. And thanks very much. Okay, so we're, we're a little over time and this is a shorter break. So the next session starting at about 10 minutes, but okay. is it okay if we take a question from asking? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, as always, Jeff, really nice uh, oh, work. Just really quick question. Did you get glutamate EC50s or biochemical surface localization? I think we talked about surface localization at the break. Yeah, the surface localization is unchanged. As far as we can tell, the, the gross anatomy of the brain is unchanged. The distribution of GluK2 immunohistochemistry is unchanged. And the uh, if we do surface biotinylation to measure surface protein, that's unchanged. If we do we did proteomic analyses. All the proteins are there that are normally there, other proteins like other glutamate receptor subunits. And if we did, when we did a um, sort of differential expression analysis using proteomics, we found essentially no differences in the, the proteome uh, between the two uh, strains of mice. A agonist pharmacology? Uh, this the 657 is the lurcher site, so it's been well characterized as being extremely high affinity, so sub micromolar affinity for glutamate. And in fact, Toshihiro just recently found that there is a small tonic current that's attributable to kinate receptor activation in the CA3 primal cells. Great talk. Um, is there any difference behaviorally between the males and the females? It's interesting that you have this issue with lethality yeah. and, and breedability in males versus females. I was just curious if there were any other male-female differences. We have not noticed that. Uh, we have not noticed any, and we have been paying attention. The, the breeding is um, due to the fact that the females tend to die in parturition, and so it, it is not so much a viability issue as just a, a birth issue. Um, as, a, as parents, uh, when it comes to the, let's say the cellular level, the glutamate uh, pathway, mm -hmm. should, be, should we be worried about glucose levels? Um, I don't think that the canate receptors have been shown to have an effect on glutamate, uh, glucose levels. Um, there are glutamate receptors of all sorts that are in the periphery, and what they do is much uh, less worked out than what they do in the brain. So um, I would say that nobody has any evidence that that might be impacted or altered. Um, but I also think probably no one has looked. Um, I'm not sure if that was the same question that I was going to ask mm -hmm. about the mice and repro re um, basically, will our does our will our daughter will she be able to have children? Is that something? That yeah, I, I would be very um, hesitant to draw a conclusion based on the mice and extend it to your daughter or other children. I, I don't think that it is, um, I don't think it's possible to make that prediction. Okay, and I have one more question. Sure. Um, um, what kind of doctors should a patient like Charlotte have lined up? She, right now, she only has a, a pediatrician and yeah. a geneticist. I, I don't know. Tim, you want to make a suggestion? <laughs> um, I would say she needs a, a developmental pediatrician to look at what sort of therapies that they think she needs, 
to investigate what is put in place at the school level with regards to our individual educational plan. So a developmental pediatrician is a, a good person to pull in. She's not having epilepsy or seizures, you know, so I'm not sure necessarily pulling in a pediatric neurologist is necessary, but I think you need a, a good pediatrician and a good developmental pediatrician um, to help with, with your educational plan. Great.